Adventists are getting noticed at one of Hungary's biggest music festivals. It's a little out of the ordinary, but offering to paint designs has attracted concertgoers to these local church members' booth. It's important to find something people will be excited about. Don't worry though, the paint is washable. They're also offering temporary hair coloring, lemonade, and of course, prayer. At events like this, church members have the opportunity to invite people to visit a nearby urban center of influence. Tunda Reeves came to this global mission urban center of influence in Mishkok, hoping for relief from her health issues. She was warmly greeted by the staff, and after some evaluation, they recommended lifestyle changes and natural treatments offered at the center. Over time, her health improved, and now she can't imagine what life would be like if she hadn't come here, not just for her physical health, but also mentally and socially. I actually developed friendships with the people working here. It's very important to have this kind of community. I learned a lot here, and it was such a community-building experience. Although these services are offered with no strings attached, sometimes these interactions lead to more than just health improvements. Since I started coming here, I've applied to attend an Adventist health camp in the summer, and I've been taking Bible studies. An Adventist summer camp opens for a week each summer. People come from all over Hungary to make new friends and participate in outdoor activities. Most have heard about the camp through various urban centers of influence or from their Adventist friends. This is a lifestyle camp. We are doing uh, lifestyle evangelism. But it means uh, that we invite friends and people who are not uh, in contact with Adventist church. We have here about 200 people, most of them are not Adventist people, and they are invited just because uh, we have hiking programs, we have cycling and different sports programs, and they are attracted uh, to this program. If we invite somebody to our local church, maybe nobody would come, at least in this part of the Europe. But if we invite them to participate in a program like this, they would like to come, because they like to be healthy, they like uh, to have new friends. And uh, in this way, this, this is a non fattening way of connect uh, with them and to connect them uh, with Jesus Christ and to the Adventist Church. The camp is a social place where people can bond together in nature. There are seminars and discussions about health and religious topics that attract many of the attendees. They're provided healthy meals that feature bread from the camp's bakery. At the end of the week, many people go home feeling inspired by the retreat and some even decide to take Bible studies or volunteer at their local urban center of influence. For those who may not live near an urban center of influence, there is another solution. Hungarian church leaders in the Duna Conference want to meet people where they are, so they created a fully outfitted ministry caravan. After purchasing a van and trailer, Adventist professionals designed and renovated the interior of the trailer to be a modern, mobile center of influence. The Duna Conference is made up of 54 churches, so each church has the opportunity to invite the van to their town for one weekend each year. The ministry is operated by volunteers who work closely with the local members who invited them to determine what type of program would be appreciated by the community. Usually, the van is parked in a central, prominent part of town, they offer health expos, children's programs, cooking classes, a Christian film club, and personal counseling. The programs of the Mobile Center of Influence have to be flexible to meet the changing needs of people in towns and cities. This van allows Adventists to connect with people in the community and develop a long-term relationship. Your prayers and giving to Global Mission have helped these ministries become a reality. Please continue to pray and consider what you can give to this cause. Thank you for supporting Global Mission. We want to make Jesus famous here. This is our goal. We, we want the people to see this place as a place of refuge, as a place uh, where they can find a family, as a place where uh, they can find Jesus or a, a peace in the midst of, of the storm. Elias and Melina left their home in Argentina and moved to the Mediterranean island of Cyprus. 
they became Adventist volunteers and now manage a global mission urban center of influence called Meeting Point. When you are in Christ, you are born as a missionary as well. So that's why we decided to, to, to take this challenge of being a missionary. We are trying to give all we have learned to serve others. Yo creo que es importante tener I think it's important to have the same method that Jesus had. First, he related to the person, saw their needs, and then preached. It's basically what we're trying to do. Use this method. Following Christ's method of ministry, Elias and Melina go door to door to find out what kind of programs their neighbors are interested in. Then they can tailor their work to the needs of the community. After just a few months in Cyprus, the volunteers have started a variety of programs at Meeting Point. I give nutrition advice, therapeutic massages, facial treatments, and things to help me grow a little closer to the people. These health programs give Elias and Melina the opportunity to connect with people who otherwise probably wouldn't walk into an Adventist church. Although many people on the island speak English, Greek is even more widely spoken. The greatest challenge here is the language. That's why we are looking forward to, to learn Greek as quickly as possible in order to communicate better with the people. They found creative ways to communicate with the Greek-speaking visitors, like using translation apps on their phones or learning common Greek phrases. When someone comes to Meeting Point, they are greeted by a warm atmosphere, refreshments, and books as they wait for their health assessment. After the assessment, visitors receive an evaluation with lifestyle suggestions and are encouraged to visit again to follow up on their progress. Meeting Point is also a place kids love. Elias and Melina host a fun activity each week and plan to expand the programs. It will be a program for kids where they will make crafts. We will make crafts, follow recipes, and play games. There's a fun part and a part where they learn something. Today's activity involves painting positive messages onto stones. The kids love doing crafts like this. But the real fun comes when they give their creations away to strangers on the street. People love receiving these precious gifts. The kids go home knowing that they've spread some joy in the community. We are sure that God is blessing this activity because we see the happiness in their faces. And we are sure that with, with time, and patience and love and uh, trying to show Jesus to them, we will see many results, many people saved by this activity. So this is uh, something that makes us very, really happy. Each Sabbath, Elias and Melina lead the worship service for the church plant that gathers in Meeting Point. Some of the people here attend regularly, while others are just visiting. Your prayers and mission offerings have played a key role in making this happen. I want to give our gratitude to the worldwide church because by your support, by your help, by your tithes, by your offerings, we are making the difference here. Thank you for supporting the Seventh-day Adventist Church and helping Adventist volunteers like Elias and Melina spread the love of Jesus to the world. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to our online church service for this morning. Um, that is actually being led out by the youth today. So just before we begin um, our service, there's just a few announcements to be made.
Firstly, uh, the church um, will continue its online um, Sabbath programs until further notice. Um, we're just waiting on advice from the conference as to when um, churches are able to be reopened. So just um, continue to watch out for any updates um, from our church pastor as to when that will be able to happen. Um, secondly, there was a board meeting last week and um, it was voted um, that there is a beautification, church beautification garden project which is going to go ahead. So they're going to be doing work on the gardens at the front of the church which includes um, cutting down the palm tree I think to be able to make um, a new beautiful garden and some more gardens um, at the back. So the church has been closed for um, the last few months but there has actually been a lot of work that has been done. So I think two weeks ago there was um, a working bee that happened where a few people came and they um, got to clean up around outside and inside of the church and um, then there's been a lot of great work from Shilhai and Bren who has um, really done some great spring cleaning around the church and it's looking very clean and um, just new and tidy so we thank them for that so it's ready for all of us when we're able to come back um, and third, just another reminder that family worship via Zoom online continues daily. So it's every day at 7.30 p.m. And if you'd like uh, more details of that, if you don't know the link, um, please uh, contact Pastor Jezreel and he can share those details with you. So it's been about um, eight weeks now that our um, community feeding program in partnership with ADRA has been running. And um, just to let you know more about that, um, I'll ask Jether and Angela to come and just um, share quickly a few of the things that they've experienced um, during the last few weeks with this program. Um, so I'll ask you guys a few questions just um, so that you can share. I'll ask Jether first. Um, Jether, what motivates you to volunteer with this church feeding program? Um, uh, what motivates me would probably be, probably be, uh, the fact that, um, you know, our youth isn't really doing much in this quarantine right now, and it's really, it's a really good way to, um, get our youth involved in, um, community service, especially, uh, uh, around Dandenong and, and, uh, to meet, um, people around our community, you know, locals and, and uh, to interact with uh, homeless people and, and uh, share stories and also hear from them. Um, yeah, what really motivates me is the act of service. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. All right, Angela, can I ask you, how has your experience been like um, volunteering at this food program? And can you share any highlights? Um, this experience has been really awesome, like just getting to know everyone, like from like the homeless people, store owners, like nearby the train station, and like policemen and um, a highlight for me would be after um, our service at the train station Janelle, Luke and I actually go to um, the hotels nearby because that's where a lot of the homeless people are right now and um, one time, actually just yesterday, I knocked on one of the doors and one of the ladies there was actually a Seventh Day Adventist so that was really good to get to know them. Thanks Angela. So I guess for both of you, what can you say um, to encourage the rest of our church family and friends to join and to help out with this program? I think it's a really good way to like for the community to get to know us and what we do because like when they go past us, they always ask who we are and like what we do. Um, it's also uh, really important to mention Andrew as well for uh, really starting this whole thing and um, also uh, um, you know uh, everything's been going smoothly and we've been getting a lot of blessings as well so it's, it's a really good success and I think a lot of people who um, you know aren't really active or uh, feel like they need to do something or, or if they want to serve uh, this is a really good way to uh, get it done you know. Okay thanks guys. So um, we've been able uh, for the last eight weeks to purchase 
about 100 meals a week and hand them out over in the streets and also at a few areas um, that we've been alerted to where um, there are a few homeless people um, staying at. We've been able to give out um, groceries um, and warm clothes. So we would just want to thank all the people who have already donated food and clothes. Um, a lot of the men's clothes, actually, I think most of them have all gone. So we're looking for more warm men's clothes. We have, um, we've had a lot of women's warm clothes being donated. So um, please, if you have um, any winter clothes, um, jackets, pants, jumpers, um, beanies, gloves, um, scarves, um, even blankets, um, they're very much requested and in need. So please continue to um, donate those if you have any spare ones lying around. And also just um, non-perishable goods. So um, biscuits, canned, any canned goods, baked beans, um, uh, canned vegetables, um, things like that. Um, a lot of the people who have come to us during um, the time aren't homeless. They're actually people in the community who we've experienced a lot, um, who've told us that they've lost their job due to the um, COVID restrictions and they're struggling. So um, a lot of the groceries that we give out, um, we also have bread that's being donated so we can give out loads of bread and they're just really thankful for that extra little bit of help as they struggle um, money-wise at this time. So we just ask that you continue to, um, to help us out by donating um, those goods. But there's actually um, an appeal that we're starting today um, for our church that will help make this program and um, more outreach community programs um, be sustainable for a year. So um, we're asking um, for 100 people in our church um, to pledge. So, we just need a hundred people to be able to pledge five dollars a fortnight just for a year so that's five dollars fortnight for a year or a hundred and thirty dollars a year and if we get that a um, hundred pledges that will enable us to continue to um, get the fresh meals that we um, we get each week so we actually get a hundred fresh meals from um, Casey Adra Cafe who cooks for us and it costs us $150. So that will enable us to buy those meals plus other um, groceries that are needed. Um, we purchase weekly milk, um, milk, tuna, noodles, um, and other little things, um, non-perishable goods that we can give away. So that will be able to help us with the groceries that we give out and any other things um, that people have approached us with that they're in need of. So I can just share quickly last night, um, last week a man um, came to us and he said that he just moved into a new house and he didn't have blankets or heaters or any other household goods. So we provided him with some of those things last night and um, actually Uncle Joseph and Uncle Roll were able to help him bring those things to his house, but actually help him move to his new house. So I think that was really um, a blessing for him. And it was a blessing for us to be able to help out the people in our community that we don't get to see coming to our church on Saturday or um, that we might not get to see in our church environment. So it's um, this program has, been able, has um, enabled us to meet people, our neighbors in the community, people around here, and just let them know that um, we're here. A lot of people have asked about our church, especially with all the anxiety and all the worry about the things that are happening in our world. They've really asked about where our church is and who we are. But it also um, just lets us show the community that we just love them. And it, um, it's not even about religion, but we just want to share God's love and just let them know that we care for them, especially at this time. So that is our appeal starting um, this week. If we could get a hundred pledges at least for five dollars a fortnight or a hundred thirty dollars for the year that will help this program be sustainable for for a year um, and if you have any more questions if you'd like to volunteer we are looking for um, all of our church to be involved um, once these COVID restrictions are ended we encourage as many people who'd like to be involved to please contact us so you can um, see what the program is all about, see what's happening and meet our community members. 
Um, so if you have any questions about this, um, please come to see myself or Ken um, and we can let you know and get you um, in touch with some of the other people who have been volunteering so they can share with you their experiences too. So um, just thanks again for those who have been helping and who have been do donating already. So at this time, um, we're going to begin our main program and I'd just like to share a verse that's found in Psalms 95 verse 6 and it says, Come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God and Maker. Um, I just pray that we all may be blessed this Sabbath as we spend time reflecting and worshipping our mighty and good God. So I'd like to call on the praise team who will lead us out in song. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'd like to invite you guys to sing with us for our first song, How Great Is Our God. Thank you for the song, Praise Team. 
I'm sad that everyone is watching on the live stream is the tithes and offerings. The importance of vows. To promise something to the Lord when under the influence of a conviction brought by the Holy Spirit is something that may protect a person from the instability of the natural deceiving heart. To keep the Sabbath, to stay married your whole life to the same spouse, to eat healthy food, to return the tithe and to give promise regular systematic percentage-based offering, or even to help the needy, for instance, will seldom happen naturally or spontaneously, because the natural tendency of the human heart is to seek its own interests and not God's will or the advantage of others. That is why vows, when made under God's influence in obedience to his word, will help us to connect us with him and will protect us from wavering during times of crisis. Those, for instance, who never vow to wake up a little earlier every morning will likely not develop the habit of communing with him before any other activity. Those who never vow to keep the Sabbath or to marry someone with whom they have a special relationship may be more prone to change their minds if the conditions change. Those who never say to the Lord, like Jacob, that by his grace and with his help they will return a tithe of everything and also give a regular and systematic offering, no matter what, may have a greater risk of, of not accomplishing God's will in this matter. In short, the absence of a firm and final decision, a promise about an important point of the Christian lifestyle, as revealed in God's word, may increase the temptation of not wholeheartedly following his guidance, and may lead that person to compromise following Jesus from afar. Considering the aspects mentioned above, do you see a need of growth in your own life? Am I willing to surrender all and to serve him, follow his will instead of the promptings of my heart? Just a reminder, um, you can still give through e-giving online, and also if you aren't able to do that, you can contact um, the pastor and arrangements can be made. Let's pray. Dear Lord, please renew our hearts today and give us the resolution to stand on holy ground closer to you where tempestuous waters cannot reach us and help us to um, be able to still pay our tithes regularly and our offerings throughout this crisis and be with everyone listening on the live stream. In your name I pray, Amen. For our second song, I would like you all to sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Church, um, can I ask everyone to 
He's fighting next to the world, bro. I'll give him a 70 for the war. We thank you so much for what you do for us. We thank you for the good vision, the safety, and the guidance that you've given this congregation, Lord. At this moment, we come to you in earnest and humble, Lord, because you don't need to be a Christian to understand that this world, the, the evil in this world is growing, Lord. And although you've told us that these times will come, Lord, Sometimes it doesn't make it easier, Lord. So I know that some of the congregation here is a bit worried, concerned, full of fear, Lord. And I pray that you give us the peace that can only come from you. Please help us to just give us understanding, Lord. And please help us to be comfortable, Lord. And help us to become the light in our communities, whether that be in our homes, and at work, even here at church, Lord. Help us to light up and to show you where Lord, to our God. And we also like to pray very special prayer for the speaker today, Lord. She comes from Sydney. She has a very powerful testimony, Lord. We pray that her, her testimony reaches as many people as it can, Lord, and help her to touch our hearts. We also like to pray that you give us the will to put all of our burdens, our worries, and all of our stress on you, Lord, because we can't handle it our own. Lord, help us to learn to worry about today, Lord, because tomorrow, tomorrow we worry about today. We love you, Lord. Please forgive us all because we sin in an unmeasurable amount. And please help us to become better and better in you, Lord. Please forgive us. In your name we pray. Amen.
Hello everyone, happy Sabbath. I hope that you've had a good morning um, so far. Uh, my name is Leah and I'm here to share with you this morning my testimony. And I'm really um, privileged to be able to join you for your youth program and um, I'm happy that we can yeah, have this time together and I pray that you'll be blessed. Um, so before I get into my story, I would just like to open up with a word of prayer. So if you could all bow your heads where you are and we'll invite God's presence to be here with us. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can have this time together to um, yeah, see the wonderful miracles you have done in my life. And I pray that you will speak through me right now, Lord, um, anoint my lips and please touch the hearts of the people that will be listening to this. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you probably never met me before, but like I said, my name is Leah and in three words, you could um, sum up my, my story, my testimony in um, rebel, raw and redeemed. And so I will um, yeah, start at the very beginning and I'll try and make it as concise as possible because my story is quite crazy and God has done so many miracles in my life and literally I would not be alive. Um, sitting here right now sharing this with you if it wasn't for his intervention in my life. So I grew up in a Christian home going to church every Sabbath. Um, I grew up with um, a, a single um, parent, my mum. My dad left when I, at a very early age um, when I was about two years old and I never remember him really being in my life. But my mum, um, I had two old, I have two older brothers as you can see here by this picture and this is us on a Sabbath morning um, going to church. And I remember we used to have worships in the morning and in the evening and I went through Christian schools, um, went through Adventist schools, um, Avondale um, Primary School, High School, Avondale College. Um, and I remember my home life was very dysfunctional and um, growing up just with one parent, um, there was a lot of things that um, were a really little struggle for us as a family. And um, there was a lot of, um, I'd say, abuse and a lot of hurt. Uh, my mum did the best she could as being, um, you know, one parent raising three children on her own, sending us through private schools. She constantly was working to provide for us, but it left us with a pretty broken family, no really guidance. And I realise now looking back, on the things that I was started to do that um, not having a father figure, I, I didn't realize it at the time to be honest, um, but now looking back, I didn't know who I was and I was trying to find purpose and fulfillment and all these things in other places. And I, it really led me into a real um, bad time in my life where at about the age of 15 years old, I started smoking cigarettes, which, is just really random, really. Um, why does any 15 year old need to smoke cigarettes? But I was, you know, trying new things. And yeah, at the age of 15 as well, I started drinking, um, getting completely, absolutely plastered, um, just absolutely hammered on it. Um, you know, the weekend was just full of you know, parties. And yeah, this is at age 15, pretty young um, to be doing this. And my mom didn't know what I was doing. Um, she was a lot working a lot and so at that age um, I stopped kind of really being um, going to church or I'd go hungover or I wouldn't and I wasn't there for the right reasons anyway and the whole God thing um, didn't really appeal to me um, but the world and the things that I was doing um, just con consumed my life. Um, so age 16 I went to my first ever rave and um, a rave is um, a party that goes all night where you stay up all night and dance and listen to really loud music, really loud techno music. And I, yeah, went to this when I was 16. I remember going there for the first time sober. So I didn't have any alcohol. I didn't have any other substances. But I remember looking around and seeing the way people were acting and I thought they would look really weird and strange. Um, but when you surround yourself with a certain type of people, it's very um, not long before you will be influenced, whether consciously or unconsciously, about what they're doing. So by the next time I went to a rave, and I stayed up all night on nothing, the next time I went to a rave, I wanted to take 
um, drugs and I started taking drugs, started taking ecstasy, started taking speed. And um, these raves like, were like just fully part of my life and I would just go there and just get so plastered on drugs and just a mess. It just made me a mess. But I thought this was fun and um, it led me though um, over like in my teen years into a really deep depression because um, abusing my body that much, staying up all night um, into the into the morning and then just getting drunk after it, like just completely getting myself in a real bad way. It started to affect me mentally because these, these drugs affect your brain you know, and they change the chemical chemicals in your brain. So um, while I was partying, I was so um, unhappy and so unfulfilled and I suffered with social anxiety. I suffered with depression. By the age of 19, I was clinically diagnosed with depression and I was put on antidepressants and I hated them. I didn't stay on them for very long because it just really affected me in a negative way being on the medication. But um, in, these party, um, in this part of my life, all these parties, I was trying to find um, attention and from other guys. I used to dress really inappropriately and reveal my body because I thought that that's what um, I should do. And I did that and yeah, just really um, putting myself out there and trying to get the attention, which I did get. Um, and I did get um, a lot of attention from other guys and yeah, but yeah, just even, in, in, even though I was in a relationship myself, um, it didn't stop me from kind of flaunting myself and um, yeah, revealing everything that I possibly could. Um, I didn't know what my identity was and I was making the world and what they perceived to be right and what they perceived to be cool and what they perceived to be, um, yeah, what women should do, what young girls should do. And um, I look back and I just feel so sad about that's the way I viewed myself and what I thought I had to do to be um, cool or to fit in. And yeah, I'm really sad about the things that I did back then. But I know this is, um, God works with us all along the way and I praise God for his mercy. Um, but I started to come out of the, the rave scene um, and I started getting into clubbing. As soon as I turned 18, I wanted to go out into the clubs and I started just, um, yeah, kind of, left the, the drugs a little bit and just started drinking heavily again. And so I'd go out clubbing, I'd go, um, I'd get kicked out of clubs because I would I'd get into fights with girls. And I would, um, yeah, bring my mum up at like two o'clock in the morning and tell her if she could come pick me up from this club. And yeah, she'd have to come get me and I'd just be a mess, I'd be crying. and. Um, and then I'd also get denied entry into clubs because I was too intoxicated for them to let me, to let me in. And um, yeah, I just guess like looking back as well, just thinking about like a, a girl getting into fights with other girls and what that looks like and how that's embarrassing really for me to even share that that's the kind of person that I was. And I didn't even think twice about it. Like I just was that's just the party life that I was living and just, um, you know, swearing at people. I didn't care how people, um, I didn't really care about other people's feelings. I was very harsh, very critical. And I just say whatever I wanted to people, even my friends, I'd, um, yeah, just the comments that I made and just, I guess, pride and, um, yeah, I didn't really care uh, how that would affect someone the way I spoke to people. Um, so yeah, I was in the clubbing scene and yeah, again, fully getting attention off other men and um, being really promiscuous um, and just really in a dangerous position. And I'm really sad to say that um, I gave myself away um, to someone when I obviously wasn't married and wasn't um, in a relationship with them. And I really encourage you girls not to not to do that, um, not to, that having um, an intimacy with a man is for marriage and it's something that is really special and it's something that you don't want to give your body away to someone else. Because let me tell you, in this, um, being a young person, um, that's the thing that even when I was at school was like the pressure and the, the thing that you wanted to do because you didn't want to be the last person to um, lose your virginity. 
And so it was almost like who could do it first kind of thing. That was how it was when I was at school. And I just really, really, really plead with you to not let yourself go down that path because um, it's not joyful, it's not peaceful, it's not the way that we were created. We were created to um, be with one person and that person that God chooses for us. And I can tell you that I made many, many mistakes and I'm trying to share with you these so you, that you will not make those same mistakes because it didn't lead me to any kind of fulfillment. It just made me feel worse about myself. Um, after I'd like come out of like the clubbing scene, I was still into parties and I was just always living for the weekends. But I started to, um, I started working at a solicitor's firm. And during this time, I, um, there was a lady who worked there who was a Seventh-day Adventist. And I'd left God a long time ago. And um, she invited me to these meetings. And these meetings were um, how to master every area of your life. So financial, um, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And I wasn't really interested in the spiritual component, but I was definitely interested in all the other components because I'd been, yeah, my life had just really turned downward very fast with my, my, with my anxiety, with my depression. And yeah, just wasn't happy with myself. Um, so I went to these meetings and it really um, helped me a lot when I started to implement what this person, what this series was all about. Um, and particularly with diet, I, um, I grew up a vegetarian, but I'd left um, even that. But when I was a teenager and when I got older, I just uh, ate whatever I wanted. But it led me back to a plant-based diet, back to a vegetarian diet. And I started to go do a bit more research about this and I became what's called a vegan. And I was just, I, got, I started to get super into health. And this is where I started to like go away from that party lifestyle and focus more on my body and what I put into it. And it really had a profound effect on me um, when I changed my diet. I then started to dabble in what was called raw veganism and I started to adopt this lifestyle. So I, one day I decided, no, that's it, I'm going to try this. And so I stopped eating all cooked food and just ate fruit and vegetables and mainly fruit. I was mainly like a fruitarian. So I, yeah, so I just really got into this. It was like my new thing, it was my new obsession, it was my new identity. So I found this whole raw vegan community and friends and people who connected with me on the same level and it was just really, I thought this was the answer to all my problems because it did help me overcome my depression and still had anxiety but it really um, lessened that a lot as well. So. Um, it really cleared my mind and I was just like, this is good for the environment. This is good for our bodies. This is good for everyone. Like, why doesn't everyone want to do this? This is amazing. And I just really became an advocate for raw veganism. And it was a really um, almost yeah, definitely like my religion. I used to spend hours on YouTube just researching and watching people's videos. And um, during this time, though, I got a disease in my bowel um, called ulcerative colitis. And this disease um, affected me by like you bleed in your intestines and you can't digest food, you can't really eat food. And so, um, yeah, I um, started to see blood in my bowel, uh, in my stools. And uh, sorry, I know it's not very nice to talk about. Um, and yeah, life just started deteriorating really quickly. Um, always had to be near a bathroom. Anyway, my life just changed after I got this disease and because I was on this lifestyle, I was like, I'm going to see, I'm not going to go to the doctor because they're just going to treat the symptoms. They're not going to, they're just going to give me drugs and tell me you're going to have to be on these for the rest of your life. And I didn't want to go and do that. So I was like, I'm going to try and fix myself. So I went on Google and I started researching about all my symptoms and I'm like, okay, I have this, I have ulcerative colitis. This is exactly what um, these symptoms are saying. And so I started juicing, I started restricting my diet even more and I started um, doing this remedy and that remedy, like you have no idea the things that I've tried um, to heal myself from this thing because it's now it's, it's been a seven, <coughs> yeah, seven year journey on with this disease. But back then it was like, I'm going to try and fix this on my own. And I went over to America to a raw vegan fruit festival. Yes, there are things that exist like that. <laughs> it was called the Woodstock Fruit Festival. And I went there in 2013 with a friend who also was on this raw vegan journey. And so I went over to 
um, America and spent a week there with um, all these people eating fruit. Crazy, I know. Um, but there was really fun, actually. You, there was a lot of fitness, there was a lot of lectures about health, and it was really, like, really cool to me to be around other people who were interested in their health as well. So I went to a, uh, um, a lecture one day on water fasting, and I was really interested about this, and I heard a testimony of a man who had Crohn's disease, which is very similar to what I had, an infl inflammatory disease of the bowel. And... He fasted for 42 days or 40 days on water and he was healed from his Crohn's disease. And I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, wow, this is what I need to do to heal myself because I tried, you know, I was, I'd been trying other things and still wasn't getting anywhere. And um, I was like, yep, I'm going to do this. In my heart, I just settled it there and then. I'm going to go do this water fast because if I can do this, then my life will go back to normal and I can't start living it the way that I want to live it. So it was a lot of money to go over there to Costa Rica. I was, um, I became engaged while I was in America um, to Josh, my husband now, and he was from Australia. He came over to America. Um, but when we, um, we went back home to Australia, six months later, I, um, I booked in for this retreat in Costa Rica, so in, in Central America. And I was going to go there and I was going to go there for two months I had to take two months of work and pay a lot of money and go over there by myself and I was very scared about it. But I decided that I needed to do this. And so I went over there and my mum, when I told her about it, she had no idea that I was even suffering with any kind of disease. I hadn't really told anyone because I was kind of embarrassed. I told her that I was going and she's like, why don't you um, get anointed? And anointing, I wasn't religious, I wasn't, didn't know the Bible, but she was a backslidden Christian at that time. And um, I kind of just brushed it off and almost made fun of her and said, oh, look, I don't know what that's about. I'm not getting anointed. I'm going over to do this water fast. And then she's like, well, I'm coming with you. And I said, no, I'm like, mom, this is my thing. I, I want to go by myself. But she persisted and she's like, okay, well, I'm going to come for the last bit. So she was going to come and join me because um, I was going to be there for six weeks and she was going to la um, join me for the last two weeks of when I'd already finished my fast and I was recovering. And so I was like, okay, whatever. And so I went over to Costa Rica. I started my water fast in the top of this mountain. Um, it was called Rio Chiripo in, in this yoga retreat center. And I um, started my water fast and um, day one goes by, day two goes by, day three goes by. Day four, day five, day six, day seven, day eight, just drinking water. By day eight, I started getting really sick, really, really sick. And it wasn't because I was hungry. It wasn't because I was hungry. I just was so nauseous. Have you ever felt nauseous before? It's a terrible feeling. You always feel like you're going to be sick, no matter whether you're lying down, you're sitting up. I just felt constantly very, very sick. And like, I couldn't even drink water. Like, I just wanted to throw up every time. Every time I'd drink water, I'd feel like my stomach was like a washing machine and just a construction site. And then I'd be on the toilet having diarrhea. So I couldn't really drink water even. That's the only thing that I was meant to be doing is drinking water. That's day eight. Fast forward the whole fast. I ended up fasting for 25 days on water and every day just feeling really, really ill. And I was really worried about myself, but I, I, I trusted myself into the hands of this person, this guru. Um, there were 17 other people there fasting and no one was experiencing what I was experiencing. They were all, you know, you know, weak and tired, which is expected on a fast, but they weren't um, really ill like me. And I had a compromised immune system. I had like open wounds in my intestines. And so I was just, yeah, really ill. And um, I actually found out when after I went to hospital, which you'll hear about in a moment, um, that I had contracted an infection from the water that I'd been drinking there. But no one knew because like this place did not have medical supervision. I was away from any civilization and I was just under the control of this man who, who said that he knew what he was doing. And he said, don't worry, you, um, you know, you'll be fine. This is just like part of the water fast. Some people get sick. Some people go through these kinds of things, but you'll be fine. Just keep pushing through. And that's the kind of person I am. I'm just going to do it. So I was getting really ill because of this infection. And um, 
I was being told that I was going to be okay. But deep down, I knew something was wrong, but there was nothing I could do about it. I was in this place so far from anyone else, so far from home, that I was just like, I was at the mercy of this, of this person and of these people that I was with. Um, I remember day 25 is when I was told, you can break your fast today. And um, I remember feeling so relieved because they said once um, really dehydrated or your electrolytes are out of balance because, you know, you haven't been able to drink enough water. And so I was just like, I remember, you know, tears just rolling down my eyes when I, when I knew that I was going to fast, uh, break my fast. And here's a video of me on day 25 um, and what I looked like. Hello, it's Leah coming to you from Costa Rica. It's day 25. I haven't filmed since day 16 because I've been really sick. But I have good news. I'm breaking today. Actually, in about five minutes. <sighs> so excited. It's been a really tough day. But I made it and I'm so excited. So, yeah, I was really sick and. Um, I had my first bite of watermelon, which you can see here on this picture. And um, I remember that was the most amazing experience actually. And, but that promise that they told me that you'll start feeling again, better again did not happen and I started feeling worse. Now um, I was having up to 17 times a day diarrhea, running to the toilet. And I was so unwell because I was so thin that um, so skinny, I was about 38 kilos at this point and I remember, um, you know, if you've ever been lightheaded before where you stand up and then you kind of lose consciousness a little bit, you kind of black out, well imagine not eating for 25 days and not having enough water and then doing that and so when I'd have to get up to go to the bathroom and run to the bathroom, I would lose consciousness while I was like collapsed on the toilet, I'd come to again and this would happen throughout the day. And I knew has to. I used to have to crawl to the bathroom. I used to have to. People would have to carry me to, you know, the meeting areas and the eating areas, because I was just. I could not walk properly. I would like walk and then I would like nearly black out. Um, and then when I started eating again, I just. I. I stopped. Um, I not only was having diarrhea now. I was now throwing everything up. And even when you throw up, you, that's like your body is like screaming at you and. Um, it was just the most horrendous thing for me to have to run to the bathroom, have diarrhea, then turn around and have to throw up straight away. I just felt so ill, so bad. And I remember one time it was like night time and I was throwing up in the bathroom and I just felt so alone. And I just remember thinking, I'm th I think I'm going to die here. Like, I think I'm going to die. And I remember texting my fiance and saying, I'm going to like, I don't feel well. I think I'm going to die. And he, he was really worried and he was messaging the leader and was like, can you please go check on Leah um, because she's not feeling well. And they just fobbed it off. They were like, no, she's fine, she's fine, she's fine. Anyway, I was just hanging out for my mum to get there. I remember I turned 25 there in this place in Costa Rica on my own with no family, no friends and um, feeling like I was going to die. And I remember it wasn't a very good birthday for me. Um, but my mum was coming the next day and I'd started eating now for a week and, I'd, and I hadn't put on any weight. I think I'd even lost weight because now nothing was staying down. I still couldn't drink water. I still couldn't eat and I was just terribly sick. And my mum comes and she gets there and it was the miracles of things that happened for her to get there. But she gets there and she takes one look at me. We embrace one another because we hadn't really spoken to each other. We hadn't seen each other and I was so scared for her to see me because I was so skinny. And she, I could tell, she's like, we need to get you out of here, Leah. We need to go get medical attention. And she made this um, <clears throat> aware to the leader of the retreat. And he said, no, you're just an overreacting mother. Just leave her here. We'll turn her around in, you know, in four days. Like, give us four more days. And she's like, no, she's been here for six weeks and she has not gotten any better. I'm going to take her. And um, but she, would, she called my husband, my fiance at the time, Josh, and there was only like a tiny little place in the mountain area to get Wi-Fi reception. And she was going there and she was trying to connect with people to find help because she was just, you know, didn't know how she was going to get me out of there. She didn't speak the language, she didn't know anyone either. And she only just had arrived. And as soon as she arrived, she was like in rescue mission mode. And I was kind of, a, not oblivious, but I was so, I was so unwell that I really didn't know what was going on. Um, 
And I remember um, she brought over with her two books, her Bible and her hymn book. And she was a backslidden Christian at this time. And so, um, but she brought those books with her because God had put it on her heart. And um, the night, the day she got there, that very night, I was up on the toilet at 11 o'clock in the night, throwing up again. And that's when she was like, no, nah, I need to do something now. So she went and knocked, went at 11 o'clock at night, went to the leader of the retreat's door, knocked on the door and said, I want to take my daughter now. Like, I'll need to go. And he's like, no, like, it's fine. And she just persisted. And while she was in the room with him um, there, his phone rings. Now, let me tell you something. He, he's an American guy, so when he came to Costa Rica, he had to buy a SIM card for his phone. He cut his, the SIM card because it didn't fit in his phone, so he cut it and put it in there, but it never had worked. And there was no reception anywhere. Like, like I said, there was only like a tiny bit of reception you could get in one spot. And um, his phone rings while my mom's in the room there with him. And he looks really puzzled. He answers the phone and he's like, hello. And then he's like, looks at my mom and goes, it's for you. And um, she was like, what? Like, and then anyway, she answers the phone. She had been praying to God for a sign. Like, how am I going to get my daughter out of here? I need help. It was my insurance company. And they're like, we're here to support you. We're here to help you get Leah out of there to a hospital. What can we do to help? And my mom knew there and then that God was there to help us. <clears throat> Just think about this. His phone had never worked. It rang the same time that she was there in the room with him and his phone and like it was a complete miracle that um, that happened. And I just, yeah, I can't believe it to this day, but we do have a God who lives and he answers our prayers and he's there to help us. The next morning, um, the, a taxi comes because my mum got Doug to help us ring some, like ring a taxi to pick us up to take me to hospital. So we take... Um, she gathers all our things. It was a horrible night. I didn't sleep any, not one week of sleep that I get that night. I hadn't drank any water for, I don't even know how long now, over 24 hours. And I hadn't eaten anything. And I just remember thinking, how am I going to make this taxi ride? It was a four hour taxi ride to the hospital down this steep, windy mountain. And I was feeling so sick, so nauseous still. And, you know, I was just having um, diarrhea and all this stuff. So I was like, how am I going to make it? But I made it to the hospital, but the taxi driver got lost for one, about one hour. And, but he could tell that I was in a serious condition. I think he wanted to get me out of his cab. Well, I get to the emergency room and it's full of people. And as soon as they saw me though, um, even though there was all these people before me, they took me they took my mom, got her passports, filled up all the paperwork and they took me straight away into the emergency place and all these nurses started coming to me to try and help me. And um, I was in a wheelchair. My mum had put me in a wheelchair and they were trying to find a vein so they could put in um, intravenous fluids into me because I was really dehydrated. And so they were trying and trying and they couldn't find... If you, if you know anything about the body, um, when you are dehydrated... You cannot find a vein to get blood or to yeah put in anything. Um, and so they're trying in my feet, they're trying in my toes, they're trying in my arms. Nothing's working. And um, one of the doctors there took my mum aside and said, look, I don't know if we can save her. She is so severely dehydrated that when we um, <clears throat> get the fluid in, um, she could slip into a coma because she'll get cerebral edema on the brain. And die and my mom starts freaking out there and then because she thought once she gets to hospital you know things will be okay one nurse though kept on persisting and, and he finally got a vein in my left arm and my mom was so thankful that she went up to him and she said um thank you so much for persisting and what is your name and he said my name is gabriel and there and then my mom was reassured that god was with her and um and she thanked him and she thanked him for, for helping get um, the vein. And then they started pumping me with antibiotics because I had a, yeah, it was riddled with an infection. Uh, my, my organs had started shutting down. They said I only had 24 hours um, to live, basically. Uh, I was the worst case of dehydration they'd ever seen. My kidneys were failing. My liver was failing. Um, I was anemic. I was very, very, very sick. They put me in ICU for three days and they try and they giving me antibiotics this whole time. Um, my mum is only allowed to see me for 20 minutes 
every four hours because I'm in ICU. In those four hours where she's away from me, she was praying to God. She hadn't slept since she'd left Australia. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and she was just um, asking God for help. Like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Like, Leah's still really sick. And so she was praying. She was reading people in Australia. They started praying. I had all these people praying for me. And I myself wasn't even a believer. I was not even following God. But I had so many people praying for me. There is power in intercessory prayer, let me tell you that, because what I'm about to tell you is um, the reason why I'm still alive today is because people prayed for me. Because after I came out of ICU, um, they put me on a normal ward where my mum was allowed to actually stay in the room with me that night. And um, going to sleep that night, um, I woke up before like I'd even gone to sleep I had sat up and I started just having this panic attack I've never had a panic attack in my whole life but I started feeling this all this guilt all this shame my heart was racing my mind was just going crazy with all these things about how like how much I put my mum through it and I just felt all this guilt and then I, um, I, I got my mum up and she was worried about me and I just remember my mind being tortured like Satan was in my mind telling me that I was lost and I remember I was going I went into a trance where I just you were looking at me but there was no one home and I was just staring down the middle of the room and my mum was saying Leah are you okay you okay and I was I couldn't respond and in this time I was being told that you're lost that your probation has closed that you're in hell and I know this doesn't make sense because I kind of had lost all my senses like I didn't know where I was and now I was just in this dark place and I was just being bombarded with all these satanic thoughts and it was torturing my mind and I was lost and I was being told the Bible's not real, that the cross isn't real, the rainbow isn't real, nothing that you believe or you ha that you used to believe is real and that you're in hell with me and I was being tortured. It was like I was stuck in a trip and that is a drug that people can take like acid where you get stuck in a certain thing and just kept on replaying and replaying in my mind and I was just stuck there and I couldn't get out and I just felt I actually thought I was in hell and that I was being tortured um, that happened for about 20 minutes and then um, I just became very violently angry and started screaming things out and I don't remember um, beyond this point but I, um, there was I was so strong and I was I was a very weak, emaciated girl, but I had the strength of many, I don't know, because there was many nurses that were in there trying to hold me down, but I was just, my body was just thrashing and it was, um, I had so much strength that it, it was not me. And I ended up biting onto my mum's stomach, um, which I don't remember. And I had her, my teeth on her stomach and they were trying to open my mouth up, but I wouldn't, I just had her and I wasn't letting her go. And I'd end up taking a chunk out of her stomach and she was bleeding everywhere. They had to take her away. Um, and I was calling out all these names um, and people were waking up in the hospital and telling me to be quiet, apparently. <coughs> the nurses in the hospital were, we came in with their rosary beads. This was a Catholic hospital and they were, had their holy water and they were, they were trying to do an exorcist. Um, and why were they trying to do that? Because they knew this was a spiritual battle that we were in. My mum was calling on the name of Jesus to deliver me. And all I could do, I don't remember biting my mum. I don't remember um, being like thrashing around. All I remember, I was this is in darkness. And I was just calling out to God in my mind. And even with my voice, which, which had changed into the voice of a man. <clears throat> and I um, was calling out Jesus, Holy Spirit, God. These are the three things that I started calling out. They would start to shoot me with Valium to try and calm me down and it wasn't working. They ended up putting me in the psychiatric ward where I was um, put into a padded cell. And um, my mum wanted to go into this room with me and they wouldn't let her because like, no, she's a danger to you. She's just like bitten you and she's a danger to herself. No one's going in there. And she's like, no, I'm not letting her stay in there by herself. And... So she went in there with those two books that um, I told you about, her Bible and her hymn book. And she signed a waiver to say, I'm going in there at my own risk. And she went in there and she started praying and she started singing hymns. And I was delivered from the power of Satan, from the satanic attack, the demon possession because of the name of Jesus. And because she was praying 
and claiming the promises of God and singing hymns. And the devil hates when you praise God, when you sing godly music. And the spirit left me. And I woke up the next morning knowing something dark and terrible happened. But I didn't know a lot of what I just shared with you. This was told me later. I did have a bit missing of my lip and I wasn't sure what happened. I said, why is there a scab on my lip? And uh, my mum, she didn't tell me there and then that I'd bitten her, but um, on the plane ride home, she ended up telling me what happened. And I just remember being in shock and um, yeah, just really upset really about what I'd done. But she said, Leah, it wasn't you, it was Satan. And she calls it now the bite of Satan. But Satan had tried to take me out and I would have been lost. I'm telling you that now. I would have gone down into a Christless grave if God didn't intervene and save me by the prayers of all those people who I don't even know who they are that were praying for me. And God answered their prayers and he answered my prayers when I was trying to call out to him in my in my heart and in my voice. And he heard me and it doesn't matter how far you've gone, it doesn't matter how much you've sinned against God, how much you've rejected him, how much you've put yourself above him and above his word when you are in trouble and you call upon him with all your heart he will deliver you and he will deliver you right there and then and you can know that there's only one other power in this world that is stronger than satan satan and that is the name of jesus that is jesus christ he is the commander of the, the heavenly host and he will answer your prayer and so after that i didn't after that experience I didn't know God yet. I didn't know my Savior yet, but I, I realized that I had been saved by, by Jesus. And I came back from Costa Rica to Australia. And after you know a long story of what happened after I got back, I was still very ill. I started reading the Bible for the very first time in my life when I was 25 years old. And boy, did I not realize what truth that we have in the Word of God. And um, I remember just learning so much about the prophecies, about the book of Daniel and Revelation, and being blown away by God's truth and by just the evidence, the accuracy about his word and how we don't have a blind faith. I'd grown up a Seventh-day Adventist and never heard all the things that we believe as Adventists and the beautiful truth, the three angels' messages that he has given us to give to the world. And... I gave my heart to God after I came back to Costa Rica a year and a half later I got baptized and gave my my, my life fully to him and after that point um, I just my life just completely changed and um, I just loved the Word of God the things that I once loved I didn't want to do anymore it wasn't even a struggle I gave up all that stuff that I was doing all the just the living for self and the way and I, I realize that my body is the temple of God and that I'm a daughter of the Most High God and that when you want to um, when you have something that's really precious like that's really expensive you want to protect it and cover it up and like your phone many people have a, a cover for their phone to cover it up to keep it protected and I learn about the way that God sees me and I um, changed the way that I dressed myself and I changed the way that I thought about myself and how I thought about other people and um, I started to yeah just love and hunger after God and I remember um, in my devotion time I used to get up at four in the morning um, and read my Bible and pray and I just spent hours and hours in his word I'd always be listening to um, the spirit of prophecy or or the Bible or a sermon um, wherever I went um, and um, I became a Bible worker. Um, I like this is a long story short, but basically, um, I left my you know my conveyancing, which, my, which when I worked in a solicitor's office, and I started working as a cleaner so I could be more involved in the local church that I became a part of. And I started with my brother and his girlfriend at the time um, a food pantry ministry because we were just we all like because I shared my faith with them. I shared with them um, the things that I had that had touched my heart. I was just like, wow, like I need to tell other people about this. And it was so natural for me to share with my friends and family 
the things that I had learned and the things that I was like amazed by. And so I, yeah, I remember, um, yeah, my brother became baptized and my mom got rebaptized. My niece um, got baptized. And it just was like a ripple effect that, that affected my whole family. And since then, um, God has opened up the way for me to be in full-time ministry. I work in the evangelism department in my conference here in North New South Wales. And <clears throat> um, I never dreamed that I would be doing the things that I'm doing now because God knows that I hate public speaking. I hate... Um, yeah, I just was terrible at it and um, I used to get so anxious and I still do not like it, but God has given me the opportunity for me to share my story and to be able to preach and be able to study the Bible with others, to be able to go door knocking, which I never thought, well, I just didn't even know that was a thing. Um, yeah, and I just want to encourage you um, that we have like a very special part to play in the second coming of Jesus as young people. And I'm not even young anymore. Well, I am young, but I'm probably not as young as you are. Um, I mean, I'm 31 years old and I wasted a lot of my life serving Satan. All my best years, all my strong years, I served Satan. I served self. And trust me, it was, it was a life of emptiness. That's the life. It's a lie. Those things that Satan tells you is going to be fun, he leads you. He tempts you to believe that the life of a Christian is a restrictive life. I can tell you that that's not the case. I've lived out there in the world and they don't have anything to offer. They themselves are empty. They don't have the true peace. You can go through trials and as a Christian you will and it won't be all roses and rainbows. But you can have the peace of God with you. And we are living in the end times where Jesus Christ will come. And he will take us back to him. And the young people, we have an important role to play. God wants to use you. And if he can use me, and if he can change my life, and he's still changing it, trust me, there's still a lot that he has to do in me. But if you keep your eyes fixed on him, if you spend time in his word and pray, um, I want to give, and you want to give your heart to God. And I, I, I pray and I ask you right now to surrender yourself fully to him. And don't listen to the lies of Satan that wants to keep you from God. He wants to keep you from experiencing your true identity, your true purpose. I can't believe it. I could never be bored again, ever. I used to, um, you know, as a young person, you can get bored because you're like, what, what can I do? Trust me, when you work for God, when you understand your mission in life, you will never be bored. I mean, Satan's going to try and tempt you and all the distractions with all these different things, but there is always something to do. You have a purpose. God created you for a purpose and it's not until you fulfill that purpose that you're going to receive the full joy of life so I pray that you would taste and see that the Lord is good if you are already committed to God I praise you for that and I affirm your decision for giving your heart to God when you're a young person because trust me I wish I would have given my heart to him many many years ago and not gone through all the suffering all the sin <coughs> all that stuff that is, is, is not worth it. Trust me, it's not worth it. So as we close, I just pray that you will make your decision right now to follow him. And if you want Bible studies, if you want to study the Bible, if you want to get into the books of Daniel and Revelation, please let me know. Um, I'm sure someone is willing to study the Bible with you. But those, those two books are something that we, we all need to be studying in these last days. So I just want to thank you for this opportunity. And I just pray that, um, yeah, just commit your life to him. In, and I ask um, that you close your eyes now as we close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for um, blessing uh, me, Lord, so much with um, the ability you've given me to share and, and share the miracles, Lord. And I haven't even shared all of them. And I just pray that you'll be with each person who's listening. And I thank you um, that we know you, um, that we have your truth and that you've given us a work to do. And I just pray you'll be with all of us now for the rest of this day in Jesus name. Amen. Yeah.
Thank you once again, Lord, for everything you've done and given us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. 